everybody. Uh, welcome, and mostly welcome to Eduardo, who is here with us today. Um, he just shared with me a very funny story of his first contact with Google, so I thought it'd be nice to start by asking him to share this story with everyone here. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, I was telling Marcia that the, first, the really first time I entered the internet, uh, I was told that I had to start from Google. So I, I wrote Google, and then I saw the, the page, uh, the home page, and I said, uh, I was afraid because I said, how much am I going to pay to make a research? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to somebody for, to, sell, to say $1 for everything, so I said. Maybe, then I realized it was not, uh, yeah, I, I didn't, that I didn't have to pay, and uh, so it was the, the start, I mean, the start of my internet experience. Cool, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we're here today to talk about your new book, um, and uh, while I was reading it, I really much enjoyed the style, and especially this conversation between Eduardo and Guido, uh, I don't know if the English edition kind of like reflects that as good, but the Italian is really interesting because you really uh, capture two different styles. And so here we're having a textile entrepreneur from Prato and an economist from Rome. They're talking to each other. And one thing that I was wondering is like, how did that happen? What's the genesis of the book? How did you guys decide to write a book together? I can't think of two worlds more different than that. Well, it's a... Uh, it's, uh funny story too because uh, we have common friends and uh, they were in the movie industry I uh, kept on telling him that he, sh he well he should meet Eduardo and they kept telling me we should meet Guido and so since the start we said we are not going to be friends <laughs> you know and um, and then he was he's not only an economist he's one of the greatest uh, uh, private equity investor in Europe he has been awarded two or three times as the best investor in Europe. So I said, not, written, not my cup of tea. And then, uh, and then I met him, and I found out a, a, a very strange person. I mean, for all his richness, because Guido is very rich, he's always worried about how things are going to go for the poorest people. He's... Um, well, he's not here, so I can talk freely. I mean, he gives, <laughs> he gives a lot of money to, to a foundation, to his own foundation, that helps um, uh, children to be uh, cured of, of, uh, of unknown, unknown illnesses. And he's, um, he's very Christian, he's very devout, and he's a nice person. So when I started to, to hear these things about him, then I said, no, so maybe we can start becoming friends. And when we, start become, when we started becoming friends, we realized that we had, uh, we had a problem with the way things were going for our country. And we shared uh, completely different uh, beginnings and completely different works and futures and destinies. But we were terribly worried about uh, the direction that Italy was going to be. Um, if I can go on, I mean, I am, uh, I, I used to be a textile entrepreneur. We, my family had a textile business that started before the World War, and we were making covers, you know? Covers for, uh, for uh, because at the beginning, uh, well, there was no central heating everywhere in Italy. You needed a cover to put on. And then we started to make fabrics and when we started to make fabrics, the war broke out. And the Germans invaded Italy. And we had a small, a small uh, company. We had uh, uh, the heart of the company were four looms. The looms were very big and very slow, but they were our richness. So we've always been weavers. But when the Germans retired from Italy, uh, the very day they, they left Prato, my, my hometown, they bombed our looms. They made them explode. They destroyed them. As they were destroying everything that had value for the people, for the Italian people. And so it was a terrible blow for us. Uh, 
I have to say that in, 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 in the coming years, they helped us to, uh, to rebuild the company because they were making orders for our, for our, for our fabrics and they were very, very good uh, and very honest customers for us. But well, the, the beginning of our relationship was not that good. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Uh, this kind of leads into the next question, which is, uh, what is the book about? Like, okay, so if, if I'm the bookstore and I'm considering buying this book, I'm a prospective uh, reader here, uh, why should I get this book? Why should I read it? Especially from the point of view of a US reader. What should well, be particularly interesting here? Well, there are a few reasons. Okay. Uh, one is uh, you get to know how things went uh, very well and then very bad for the fashion industry, for the fashion system. Um, uh, our, um, our company, our textile company was working for the most important stylists in the world. You name it, I mean, we were working with all of them. And, uh, and we were delivering good quality at a good price because it, it's very difficult to work with Giorgio Armani, for example, because Giorgio Armani he makes personally the choices of the fabrics because he's very, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't leave a lot of space to his people, but he's extremely good. He's one of the few stylists that really knows something about fabrics. And so we, I mean, we were working at the highest level in a way. We were doing fabrics for coating, for jackets and uh, and not only in wool, in linen, cotton, everything. We were very good. This I want to state because uh, every time uh, we, we discuss how Italian uh, textile system went down, went uh, almost bankruptcy, there is always the problem with competition. We didn't hold on to competition. We couldn't face competition. But it's a bit more difficult to say, I mean, it's different. Uh, it, it's another kind of competition, then maybe in, in, we'll, we'll go on with this. Um, so this is one is the reason. The second reason is why Italy is not what it used to be. It's not anymore what it used to be. Uh, how everything really lost meaning and sense in the production of well-being. Wh whatever happens in, in the United States always affects Italy. And the beginning of the book is uh, uh, is uh, the uh, Millennium Celebration by Bill Clinton in Washington, and the end of the book is the inaugural speech of Donald Trump. And the book tells also the story of, what, of, of everything that happened in the financial uh, world in those years, and how the, uh, and how the, uh, all the crises were faced in Europe and in the United States. I mean, it's, it's a small book, but it has inside uh, two stories, which could not be uh, more different than one from the other. So I am the loser in the story, and Guido is the winner. I don't like to say that, I mean, it's about, <laughs> it's how the Italian, the Italian publisher uh, kept on talking about the book. So at the end of the book, I, I said, maybe, maybe that's the story because I lost my textile company and Guido is still one of the most important investors in Europe. Uh, another reason why you should, uh, you should probably read this book is that we discuss about fast fashion, which is this terrible phenomenon that you go to, you go to all these giants like Zara on the H&M and you go there and you buy something and you think that, that it's fashion because it looks like fashion. It has the right colors. Uh, if, you, if you see things from 10 meters away, it's a perfect uh, imitation of what fashion should look like today. I'm wearing a Zara jacket. If ah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> but then, well, I, let, me let me tell a story. I mean, one of these giants, uh, uh, my daughter Angelica, uh, she, when she was very young, she wanted to go there. She said, Babo, you have to take me there. And when she says this, I, I always do. I mean, everything, what she, whatever she wants, I do. So <laughs> I even went into this, into this shop. It was a fantastic experience for me because um, 
they came to us. They wanted to buy our fabrics. And they said, the fabric is fantastic, and, but we cannot pay 15 euros per meter. We can pay seven. So do a seven uh, euro version of this fabric. I said, this is impossible. I mean, you are choosing cashmere just to make it. <laughs> and you want cashmere for seven euros, it's impossible. OK, so uh, that just to give you an idea of how dealing with, with these people uh, works. So we enter the shop, and we see things. And the shop is fantastic. The music is fantastic. The sales people were very good. And, uh, and then you see the stuff uh, from 15 meters. And you say, well, it's, it's good. The colors are, are very good. The buttons are. And then every step you do towards the, 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 the towards the jacket or towards the coat, you say there is something wrong. And then you touch it, and then you see what the problem is. But then you realize that you, you are already inside uh, the idea of blackmailing yourself. Because you go there and you say, this is a jacket, and it costs 39 euro and 99. Also this thing, no, you know. <laughs> 39 and 99. If you go to, to another shop and you buy something better, it is 100 euro. And then you say, I don't know, maybe I should save this and have the same thing. I mean, it's not as good. I know it's not as good, but it, it will work. And it usually does for two weeks, for three weeks. The fourth week, you have it. Then you start to see a button losing, and there is a problem. And then it, whenever you wash it, you know, some, I, I think some, you have the same experience. You realize that. And, and then you see how, how this, this phenomenon really works on you. You decide what to do. You trick yourself in believing that you are saving money. But then you start to realize that uh, uh, Zara, uh, for example, is... Uh, is growing bigger and bigger every year, and his owner is one of the most one of the richest person in the country. So somebody is buying these things. So you are not saving that much, because uh, there is a research that says that, for example, in Great Britain, every 20 days you buy something. So at the end of the year, you spent a lot of money on things that are not as good enough and as you should they should be. It's the idea that. Whenever you buy something, you forget about the price. And then you forget about even that you bought it. Because their fantastic system is such that uh, every week there is a new collection. And it's, it's, it's real. It's true. Uh, when, whatever they don't sell, they discard. It, it's sent away. You don't know where. Well, if you look at the true cost, which is the very interesting documentary that was made uh, by Andrew Morgan, you see where it, it, it ends up in the poorest country, where there are mountains of these discarded things that they were uh, bought and, and thrown away, or even they were unsold, and so they were they followed the same destiny. But I maybe went into into another another way. But this is one of the reasons you should read the book because we, we discuss this, and I know the subject. I mean, so. Uh, well, it's a sad story, but I know the subject. <laughs> oh, thank you. So one of the most revealing moments of the book for me was the, the explanation that quantitative easing that, that uh, uh, somehow worked in the US didn't really work in Italy. And essentially, the money stopped at the banks, right? And it connected with the thought that I always had was how much easier it is to borrow money here with respect to Italy. So. It, it, it's always been shocking, and I, and I was wondering: is, do you, do you and Guido think that there could have been a way to actually make it work in Italy? Well, Guido could answer better than me to this question. But anyway, the problem is this: well, quantitative, quantitative easing was made by the European Central Bank to save Italy from a terrible crisis. You, you will remember that Greece was a, was in crisis and. Together with Greece, after a few months, Italy went in a financial crisis so bad that the spread between our bonds and the German bonds kept on rising. Uh, 
and it, was, it had become all, almost impossible for the Italian government to, to issue new bonds because they were so expensive that we should have been uh, bankrupt if, we, if, if that phenomenon could go on for months and months. So the, the European Bank uh, made the right decision. The problem is that, you know, we are in Europe and we, we love to think that we are a big single community of different states. The problem is that we are very different and that uh, uh, Germany is so strong, has a so, such a strong economy, such a strong state that uh, sometimes the European politics uh, trying to help the poorest country like, like Greece, like Portugal, like Italy, like Spain, uh, well, that hurts uh, uh, the interests of Germany. And so uh, it's very difficult to legiferate in a way that uh, everything is good for everybody. So we, um, so we went into this uh, the, uh, quantitative easing and the, the European Central Bank uh, started to create money, to print money and to buy bonds. But if you buy bonds from the state, you help the state, but this money which is billions and billions of euro every month, uh, stops there. It doesn't go to the people. It doesn't go to the, to the business. It doesn't go to the private companies. And so there is a huge creation of money, and it doesn't go to the people. And that's how uh, it works in Italy, which is crazy, because uh, not going to the people, uh, the voters, for example, they do not even know that the quantitative easing is going on in Italy. Uh, what happened in the States, I think, is that uh, whenever an economy is based on consumption, everything goes to the consumer because it's interest of, for everybody. In Italy, it, it didn't work out, so we were uh, inundated with money and we didn't see even a single drop of it. Yeah, that's it's kind of crazy to think about it. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it's, it's crazy because that, that ocean of money really saved us, but saved the state. In Italy, we are, uh, we are not so sure that we are the state. In Italy, we, we, <laughs> we, we try to think that the individual are one thing and the state is another. Very often in a fight, in, in a cruel fight between, between, uh, between, between them and so, um, I think I, 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 did I answer the question? I'm still just wondering, like, was there actually a way to make it work? Was there gonna, was there a possibility of like getting this money to the people rather the, than stop at the bank? This is the question that is in the book. And I asked Guido that, too. so why, why is it so? Yeah. Why, why don't you help the economy? Why don't you make it possible for small uh, companies, well, for well, small business to, to, to have money and to, uh, and to, to invest, uh, to, to buy new ma machines and to, to hire more people. And he said that, that the Germans are afraid of inflation, which is funny because inflation is nothing in Italy. And it has been nothing in, in, whole, in whole Europe for, uh, for years and years. But they are afraid it could grow up. You know, I, I have a different approach to this because when I was, when I was young and Italy was growing like uh, at the same rhythm that China is growing now, which that is 7% per year, in those years, inflation was very high. And uh, so I, I grew up for, for and, uh, in, in a time and in a play in, in a country where inflation has been up, you, you will remember probably, up uh, more than 10% every year and everything was going on, it was going perfectly. So I'm not Guido, Guido would be, uh, the, uh, would be perfect to answer this question, but I still think that a little bit of inflation is not very bad for a country. Cool, I'm gonna switch a little bit here and get maybe a little bit closer to, to me and to this audience. So. In the late 90s or early 2000s, well, you and many other people in Italy were sort of sinking with the boat. We got out. We took our wonderfully publicly paid education from Italy and came to the US and where we thought we were going to get more 
uh, possibility is, is known under the name of brain drain, and there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, and, you know, a few of us went back, but most of us stayed here. Um, are we guilty or are we innocent? What could we do to give back now, and why didn't you make a similar choice? Well, uh, let's start with the beginning. You are innocent, and you are making Thanks. honor to our country Thanks. being here and working as good as you are. I mean, this is extremely important that the Italian image is defended abroad by people like you or, or, or many other people that maybe are here and they come from different countries. But in Italy, it's, it's even more important because uh, uh, the brain drain we had is terrible. It's still going on. Well, it's accelerating, as a matter of fact. But there is nothing you can do. You have to make uh, your own choices, your best choices. And, and then you have, uh, the problem is that we live in a system and in a country that uh, not only allows this, but in encourages this. We are encouraged to go out. I mean, my son is studying contemporary art in London. My daughter is studying now in Milan at the Polytechnico, but in, uh, in the next few years she will start a master somewhere, maybe, maybe, maybe in, in California, maybe in England. Uh, uh, you have to go out. This is not, this is not anymore the time where uh, you can live a working career in your country. Uh, let me say one little thing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ho my hometown, Prato, uh, it was and still is the biggest textile center in Europe, even, either in production and in quality. And it was possible that uh, if you wanted to make textile, if you wanted to make fashion, uh, living in Prato all your career was a, was a fantastic choice because that's where the, that was the place if you wanted to learn how to make uh, uh, linen with Teflon, or you wanted to make Kevlar with nylon and with wool, that was the place. Now it's not, it's not that way anymore. So even if you want to make textile, you don't have to live in Prato, so, or, or, or in Italy. Many of our best uh, technicians now work in China uh, or uh, in other places, I mean, so. Uh, it's a big world and you are not, you, you don't have to, you, you, well, you are not guilty and you should never feel guilty for this. <laughs> and so why, why didn't you make a similar choice? Well, it's, it's a funny story. I was a bit afraid of this because I started very well because I had the idea that I, I wanted to come here to, the, um, to attend the university and I, I was in a summer session in, in, in 85 and 87. I went to Harvard and I went to Cornell, so I, I knew the system. But then, you know, it was the, the, the golden age for Pratt, and everything was very, uh, you know, la dolce vita. It was la dolce vita. <laughs> and I was very young, and I didn't have not even a friend that was coming with me, and my family was perfectly okay with the idea that I stayed in Prato, and so I had no, no strength, no courage enough, let's say, to come here. Maybe it's a timing thing. Just a few years made a big difference. Maybe. And maybe. then if I, I met Carlotta, my, my, my wonderful wife, and so the idea of coming to America was finished. <laughs> so in the uh, most recent uh, part of your life, you've been a politician, and you've been a member of the parliament. Um, we are coming out of a very well, coming out, we're probably not yet out of a very interesting political season in Italy. Elections happen. Um, situation is very confusing. We're still not clear on who's going to govern in Italy. Uh, but one thing is clear is that there's this new Cinque Stelle movement um, that's the fastest growing party. And uh, one of the key points of their program is actually the protection of Made in Italy and the elimination of the IRAP tax. And you touch both of those things in your book. And uh, so I was wondering, that, that must be feel, feeling very close to you. And are they getting this right on this front? Is that the solution? Uh, let me start with the beginning. Uh, after my, my, my book, Story of My People, won the Strega Prize, uh, many politicians uh, 
seem to start to think that I was right on the fact that you have to uh, understand how impossible had become for a textile company or even for every manufacturing company in Italy to survive. And so they said, why don't you enter in politics? Why don't you uh, candidate? Uh, why don't you enter in the, in, the, in the system and try to give a contribution and try to help? That was very naive. Naive uh, on my side, uh, because I, th I thought it could, be, it could be true. So I entered the parliament. I, I was a candidate, and I was elected, and then to the parliament. And I thought that I could really make a difference, which is, in retrospect, even very funny. <laughs> Let me just tell you one thing. The, the, the Chamber of Deputies in Italy has 630 persons. The Italian Senate has uh, 315. So when we elect the president of the republic, we are 1,000 people. So um, I know that you, in Congress you have so much less of this number. You know, you have uh, many. Not, not, I, I'm sure it's hard for you to understand how is it possible that 1,000 people are needed to govern a country. And then you see how bad they govern it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because there are so many. I don't know. Uh, but this Cinque Stelle phenomenon is something I have to spend a, a few minutes to tell you about because it's, it's very funny. So the creator of this phenomenon is a stand-up comedian. No, you're laughing, but it's true. <laughs> he, he, he was one of the most yeah. important stand-up comedian in, in Italy. He was very good, very funny. Then he started to say that everything had to change and um, he started to found this movement and uh, and they won the election, okay? After 10 years, uh, they won the elections. And uh, believe it or not, the people that are um, elected by this, uh, by this movement, they are, not, they, are, they are chosen online. So they, I see your expression, I mean, <laughs> but it's true, okay? So you, you say you want to be elected, and you, you go in, in, a, in a particular site, and you, you say that, uh, um, you present yourself, you make a video, and the people go there, and they choose you. And some of these people were elected with 50 votes, 5-0. So their friends, they voted for him, and uh, uh, they were in, in, in a part of the list that was elected because so many Italians voted for them. Uh, and they won the elections. They, they, they went very well in the last elections, and they won this. And the people there, they uh, are usually directed by, by, by a company in Milan and by the stand-up comedian that is still there. And the last thing he said, work is not important, he said. You, you laugh, but, <laughs> and I laugh, but it, it's what he said. And the people voted for him. They said, uh, the state should pay the people to live. He said uh, it should be 600 euro a month, which in dollar is uh, 800, something like this. Yeah, roughly, yeah. And uh, they won the elections with this promise. And now we are in the process of making a government with, uh, uh, with the Lega, with the League, which is a, a, a racist party, which is a, a fascist party. Uh, so then, well, this is, this is how Italy has become. This is why this book had success in Italy, and I hope it will have success here, because it tells an incredible story, okay, of how one of the most fantastic country in the world really went down the sink. But anyway, uh, last thing to say, uh, made in Italy. Yeah. There, the Movimento Cinque Stelle say that we want to protect the made in Italy, okay? Not e uh, well, they, they, there is a percentage. 10% only of their elected people have been working a single day in their life. The rest, 85% of the people, because when you go into the parliament, you have to, to present your, 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 your declaration. You have to say how much you've been making money. 85% of them have never worked. They were students or they were 
in between jobs or they were living with their family, okay? And so when they say in parliament that they want to protect the Made in Italy, I always ask them, what do you know about Made in Italy? What have you been doing for Made in Italy personally? <laughs> what do you know about this? But it's that, well, I, maybe I should stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Because I realize how, how, how emotional it can become on the, on the subject. Because the problem is that they should not win. Somebody else should have been uh, an alternative for the people. You know, you should have been going to the election and say, vote for me, don't vote for these people. But uh, I know there is another funny thing. There, there are promise of the 600 euros a month uh, has been, um, has been uh, understood by, by the people. So uh, they read on the, uh, and they watched on television. They saw, on, they read on the newspapers and online that the Cinque Stelle won the elections. So they went uh, to the common and say, give me the 600 euros. So I said, man, you know, they, yeah. uh, they said they won. We voted for them. Give us the money. OK, <laughs> which, which, is, which, is, which is true, which is fine, which is a good reaction. Problem is that. They will, not, they will never be able to, to make up this promise. All right, so it's, uh, we're not doing much better <laughs> than no. before. Well, we'll come to that, but we'll come to that, I think. So let's go to American politics now. Um, at the last minute, you called Guido pleading to cancel the book because you, you, you perceived that you were inadvertently supporting Trump based on his campaign and inauguration speech. Uh, so based on the kind of the past year that Trump has been in office, do, do you think he's actually been able to make any difference with respect to the situation of the middle class in America? Well, it, well this is a funny story because when um, uh, I, I followed the elections, uh, the American elections, and uh, I had to stay up very late at night because, because of, the, of, the, of the difference of the time zone. And, well, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand the, the situation because, you know, uh, I still remember how the polls went so terribly wrong. And, I, uh, and then when I saw that Florida was, was lost, I said, I'm going to bed. I don't want to know anything. So I went to bed and I saw how the, the disaster that came. And, but the inaugural speech was important for me because we wanted to, to finish the book with the inaugural speech of the new president. And we thought about Hillary, of course, because he wanted to have the, his husband at the beginning and her at the end so, and see how everything had changed after so many years, how globalization has changed. If, if anybody had to say something about the disaster that came for many people in, in the Western world. And then we found with Trump. And I don't know, maybe for you, I'm sure for you it, it was even more incredible than for me, but seeing President Obama with this, with this, uh, with this person, uh, taking him and, and helping him to the, to the podium, and it, it was terrible. And the inaugural speech was full of the things that we wrote in the book. Because one of the problems that we had with Trump was that uh, uh, a lot of things that he said, in, and then he will never be able to maintain, of course, uh, there were uh, some, something that could have been used in Italy to stop the, the disaster. I'm not talking about America first, because Italy first is even funny to say because we don't, uh, um, we are exporters, we are net exporters, we live on export. And so uh, whenever we say that you yeah, want to close the market for, for us, it will be a disaster. And so when we, when we heard the inauguration speech and we said, we heard what, what he said, we said, let's cancel the book. We don't want to be, we want anybody to think that we agree with this, uh, with this person. And, uh, and we were about to, to cancel it, but then we, we, we were able to understand how uh, the problem with globalization is not, it's not even the election of Trump, it's something so much bigger that maybe there should have been a different approach since the beginning, because I'm sure that 
uh, we all believe in open markets, we all believe in free trade, but then we also have to understand that, for example, uh, there is a lot of the quality of life that you risk to lose whenever you buy the cheapest good. This idea of the cheapest good to buy is something we sh really should think about because there is an underside to that. When you spend less money for something, you spend less money in a quality of the thing. And the quality of the things you buy, you wear, you use is very important, not only for, for, for the general market, but even for yourself. Because if you dress bad, you will live bad. If you, uh, if you buy something that is not in a good quality, then even your life will be affected by that. And uh, we should have been discussing this before starting the process. So that, that, that brings to a little bit back to Europe, um, the euro. So there's, there's a, a great description in the book of like what, what the euro and what getting into Europe meant for all the different countries. And I really enjoyed the contrast between the southern and the, and the northern Europe. Um, what should we have done there? Not get in? Negotiate no. better condition? Shall we get out now? No, 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 no. <laughs> that would be the final, the final stroke for us. Yeah. No, uh, I've never been against the euro. I think it, it's extremely important. Uh, maybe we should, ha well, think about this. I mean, you, you take uh, um, uh, European countries which are completely different one from the other and you, you put all of them together and you give them a single currency, okay? And then you start to realize that, uh, for example, Greece, uh, uh, Greece uh, 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 didn't say the truth on the, uh, on the declaration when it, it got into Europe. I mean, the, the, their, their balance sheet was not, was not correct. It, was, it had been falsified. So uh, the speculation, let's call it like this. Guido wouldn't like it, but, I mean, but it, let's call it the speculation. They started to assault Greece. Uh, and, um, and after Greece, Italy. And uh, so we said, we are Europe. I mean, the Central Bank of Europe will save us. It didn't happen like this. The Germans said, we are not going to, to spend money to save, to save Greece. I mean, they, that's a country that has been uh, corrupt for, for, uh, for, for centuries. And the same thing they said about us. I mean, the interests of these countries are too different. So it's a very difficult, uh, um, how would you say, it's a very difficult system to stand inside. And so the, the interests are different. The, um, the politics are different, the countries are different. Uh, Germany is so strong and so good and so perfectly administered and Italy has, doesn't have the, the chance to stand up to this. So until they will keep us in the Euro, I would like to stay there. And I think it's, it's Italy's interest to be there. Cool. I'd like to know if there's a, open it to question in the audience if there's any. Well, one of the things I noticed you had uh, commented on was the large number of people in Parliament who said had never worked. And this has also been a theme in the U.S. And one of the kind of structural reactions to that was the introduction of term limits for politicians. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on whether you think that would be a good thing, a bad thing, if it would help? Well, of course it would be. There, there is... There is a uh, in Italy, for example, in the new parliament, there is people that have been elected seven times, eight times, and they really that did nothing to, to justify these, these seven or eight elections. But it's a system of power that perpetuates in itself, and it's something that uh, it could be done. I mean, well, it depends on how many terms, because if you say two terms, it, I think it's not enough. It might be three terms. But then when you think about a political term here in the United States, you think about four years. In Italy, uh, a government co can last months. So whenever there's a term of a few months, maybe it's, it's not enough to, 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 uh, to state your competence. 
So, well, yes, I think, I think that there should be a limit. And uh, uh, even, I mean, you have here a, a two terms limit for a president, for example. In Italy, you had people that had been president of the, um, well, premier, let's say, for three, four times. And I think, it, if it, yes, yes, I think I would support it. What do you think is the hope for the middle, middle class? What things can the private sector and government do to preserve the essential role of the middle class in democracy? Well, this, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is the question, the most important one. Uh, let me just tell you a, a brief story. I mean, uh, one of the reasons why I said that Italy was a fantastic country was that uh, for, uh, let's say, 50 years, uh, the idea like that we, you, you call the American dream was also the Italian dream. But it, it was even more, because let, think about this. We have a south of Italy, which is in a very bad situation since ever. Uh, and we had a huge immigration from, from Campania, from, from the south, to, even to Prato, to my, to my hometown. And they came there, and they started to work as ordinary workers, and then they started to, to buy one loom, two looms, and they started to become entrepreneurs. And uh, this system, this idea that your destiny was not already written was a, a, an extremely strong motivation for the people. And in Italy, we used to say, well, Prato was one of the, of the centers of this. I mean, if you, if you study, if you work hard, then you will make money. And this is a fundamental promise for middle class because you, be, well, you enter the middle class. Uh, if you think about it, Italy had not a big middle class uh, after, um, after the war. You had very rich people and you had very poor people. And, and then you started to create a middle class with this, with work, with people that started to work in, uh, in the private sector and started to work in, in banks and in services and in industry. And uh, there was a creation of well-being that was in American in a way. And um, you know, it was funny because then, always in those times, the Communist Party was extremely strong in Italy. So you had a strong Communist Party and a, a huge economical growth. I wonder if these things can, in a way, go together. But that was very, very interesting. And then we had a fantastic um, growth and the middle class that started to emerge and uh, but the problem is that this middle class never asked for a better politics. They kept on voting for the same party, which was called Christian Democracy, uh, for many, many, many years. And they never asked for something better. They were too busy trying to, to make money. That, this is one of the problems. But what, what, what can be done now, uh, it's very difficult because uh, you cannot grow up, uh, uh, well, the startup, the, 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 the startup phenomenon in Italy is, uh, is, is, is coming. I mean, it's, it's important, but not even one of these startups is labor intensive. All of them, they need one, two persons, and that's all. Uh, my company had 40 people working all day, and then, that Prato had a system that production could be made by many other people that were working for you. And this is a contradiction of what the general economic theory says. It says you have to unite everything, all the production under your single, uh, after in your company, so you keep uh, uh, things uh, under control. And what happened in Prato was that everything was given freely to the other people. I mean, I'm, you could have just an office and a telephone, then somebody was going to uh, spin the wool and make, uh, and, make uh, and, and then you can have somebody weave it, weave it for you, somebody dyeing it for you, somebody uh, finishing it for you, and then you had um, your product and you were selling it. And the, the quality was fantastic in every step because the private people that were working for everybody they, were, they had to be very good, otherwise they wouldn't work. So the system was working perfectly. 
And that was creating middle class because you have people from the South that had nothing, and then in, in 10 years they had, uh, they had a house because there was a banking system there and money was given freely, maybe too freely, but, but not so much, not so much. Until the 1990 money was given with a certain ease, but it helped a lot. So what can be done now? Uh, frankly, I don't know. I don't have a, a lot of hope on this. Um, but coming here to California, for example, I, I, I've been here today, so I saw almost nothing, but I, re I started to recognize some signs of, a, of, a, of a, an economic growth. And that was exhilarating for me. It was really, I was, you know, seeing people that uh, work hard to make money and really make money, it's exhilarating for me. It's something, it's a throwback to my past. So it was nice to be here. Um, so here at Google and um, I think in the tech industry in general, talk a lot about access and building for everybody. Um, but on the converse in your book and in, in uh, media in general, we hear a lot about this problem, in particular the economic divide increasing um, over a span that we'd also associate with a technological um, improvement or, or increase in access. Do you think the tech industry is uh, helping um, mitigate the problem? Is it, is it improving this issue, slowing it down, or is it uh, accelerating it? This is a very good question. Uh, uh, it might help. It might help more also. Um, uh, when, uh, because this, this is one, one of the, the, the relationship with the technology was one of the problems for Italy and for textile, for example. Textile is one of the industry where working with a loom that is 30 years old or three years old if you, if you have to weave wool, it's more or less the same. And this is terrible. Because if, you're not, if you cannot count on the help of technology, the future is terrible. And somebody can take your business very easily. Uh, for, some, uh, for some fibers, for example, it's even better if you work it with uh, very old looms. Uh, there are not many, there are not many successful uh, companies, in textile companies now in Prato, but one which is very successful, and they make, uh, the sharpe? Scarf. Scarves, scarves. They are actually friends of mine. Uh, they make scarves with the, with the most beautiful and fine cashmere in the world, but they, um, they weave the scarves with hand looms by hand, and they have people Sometimes there are old ladies that know everything about this, and they 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 work with the hand loom, and they uh, if it takes one month to make a, a scarf, then it, it's okay. And you sell it; they sell it for five hundred euros, a, par, a scarf, a part, and it's okay. So this is one of the direction we could go, and we are going. Uh, but it's, it doesn't help to hire people, you know? And that, that, that's, I think, is a huge problem. When, when technology cannot help you, you don't, have, you don't have a great hope for future. I'm curious about the dances in the title. Where does that come from? Oh, it comes from, it, it comes from the doors. From the title, you mean? The title, yeah. Everything title. is broken up as dances is a verse from, by G. Morrison of the doors. And uh, being here in Venice today, I, I thought that, that how funny things that everything starts and finishes here because <laughs> he was working here and he was uh, playing here. And so probably he, he made the poem here in Venice and we are here talking about him. And uh, well, the idea is that uh, I always loved the, 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 the doors, but then also the poetry of Jim Morrison. I read all of it. And, this, this particular verse is, I think, is perfect to, to summarize how, how things are becoming increasingly difficult for, for my country. We, we really feel that everything is breaking up 
and dances because it's always in, in a constant movement and we cannot keep it still. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank Eduardo Nesi for being thank here you. with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much.